Hello, my name is Dr Libby Salno and I'm a palliative care doctor working in the community in London and an academic who has spent the past two decades exploring, understanding, uh, describing the compassionate communities movement across a range of different global contexts. And I've most recently published the Lancet Commission on the Value of Death, bringing uh, death back into life, which we published last year. And I will talking, be talking a bit about that during the presentation today. So our, the title of the talk and what I hope we'll be exploring for the next 30 minutes is the role of compassionate communities in death, dying and grieving systems. I'm going to start by understanding what death, dying and grieving systems are and understand why we're using the language of systems. Secondly, to learn about how these systems may be changed and improved. And finally, to appreciate the role the compassionate communities movement plays in systems change and to really understand the importance and significance of compassionate communities. So we're gonna start by understanding what systems are. Now we're used to navigating systems, educational systems, transport systems, financial systems, healthcare as a system. And we're used to understanding that these are complex to be in. They require knowledge, uh, an awareness and ability to navigate different parts of the system, how well they work depend on how well different parts of the um, system talk to each other, how well they communicate or how they don't communicate. And so different people have different experiences of systems. And I think that's the really key thing to understand. In healthcare, it's really important that we um, understand systems because healthcare really is a very good example of, of a, a very large and complex interconnected systems. And if we don't understand and appreciate that complexity, and if we don't um, understand the kind of interconnected nature of systems and healthcare systems, then we get to very kind of reductive or um, reductionistic reasoning and thinking where we just think that a simple solution of changing one part, moving to this part, will then improve health outcomes without appreciating that whole complexity. We also make the mistake of thinking about static options. So systems are always changing. And because just because one thing worked at one point or at one place, it doesn't mean that then it will work in the same way in another time or in another place. And so we often have this kind of static option. One solution fits all. And often it can lead to magical thinking where the idea that there's just one, there's one magic solution, one medication, one pathway, one guideline that will really change everything within that system. And we know that is very rarely likely to be uh, the case. And also, if you don't understand that the entirety of and the complexity of a system, then often you get fragmented approaches that just take into account one part of a system, try and change that without understanding its wider or real world context. And this can lead to significant inefficiencies, fragmented approaches, unintended consequences, and crucially, inequities. And we see that um, really prominently within end of life care, both within countries, as there's significant differences with how, where, why people die, and then obviously across countries with availability of medication, for palliative care, or other experiences um, when at the end of life. Systems really have the fundamental the fundamental term to understand when we're thinking about systems is complexity. These are not simple A plus B equals C um, equations. These are complex interconnected um, natures that we need to understand um, and appreciate this kind of the, the multiple connections that exist within systems. And it's not only the different actors or components that take place that, are, that exist within systems, but it's also the relationships that exist between those components or the absence of relationships. And that's often what allows systems to function or to dysfunction. Systems are created by us, they're human made, and they usually exist to maintain the status quo. So they exist to continue things in the same way, whether we intend that or not, that's, um, that's often how they behave. But there is change and unpredictable behavior. And we saw one of an example of this was when COVID came into the world and we began uh, having significant system changes across transport, education, obviously healthcare, et cetera. And so there can be sudden huge changes within systems and there can be gradual changes. But crucially, not all changes out of our hands. There are leverage points, so points that we can intervene to change 
systems, improve them for the better. So we don't need to be passive in that. This iceberg model, I think, is really helpful to understand uh, what we're thinking when we put on a systems thinking hat or how when we use a systems perspective. So above the water level, we have events um, that you can see the visible part of the iceberg. And this is stuff that we, we would see. So, um, for example, changes, people uh, having pain as they die, people dying in pain or um, people having uh, dying in hospital, increasing numbers of people dying in hospital. So these are the kind of things you see um, if, and if you observe those happening. But then we need to go beneath the surface to understand why this is happening. And you ask a series of more complex questions to understand how we might change this. So the next is what patterns and trends exist. So has this been happening over a long time? Is this happening in one place or is this a trend across a country or globally? And are, is this changing over time? Is it getting worse or getting better? You then go one level further down to look at the underlying structures. What's changing within healthcare, within hospitals, within policies, within funding? Why are these kind of things happening? What other things can we see that might be influencing that or might be being changed as a result of the things you're seeing? So understanding what structures exist within society, within countries that is enabling this or are changing as a result. And then the final thing you go down to is the mental models or our assumptions, the culture, our beliefs about certain things, narratives. And this might be looking at beliefs around dying, um, the spiritual beliefs of what we believe might happen, what it means to value someone at the end of life, how we express that value, and ideas of immortality that are increasingly being seen in certain countries where people are really trying to extend life expectancy, or even just the belief in healthcare, that there will always be one more treatment and there's always one more solution. So the, this, is, this model allows us to kind of examine a problem from a much more complex perspective, rather than just taking for granted what's happening on the surface and trying to find a solution uh, that manages that. And the crucial thing that we all understand in our daily lives, but somehow often when we come to looking at interventions or research or changes in healthcare, we often begin to start thinking in a slightly more simplistic way. But real life is complex. And what we need to do is apply that model and that paradigm to thinking about change when people are dying or caring and grieving. So there's a couple of maps here. I just want to show you where people are using this think type of thinking in other areas. So this is a map, a systems map of how, uh, what's happening for neonatal mortality in Uganda. And here, it's not as simple as saying, well, we need midwives to wash their hands before deliveries, or we need, uh, mothers to attend prenatal care, or we need to run a clinic to allow people to access in rural areas. It's not just one of those situations, all of those different parts need to be changed to really improve neonatal mortality. And so it's an example of the complexity. And the next one is uh, too small for you to see the details, but this is um, a map about how to improve obesity in the UK. And again, this isn't just around, say, policy changes or taxes on very sugary drinks or fatty foods or reducing fast food, unhealthy food outlets near schools. It's so many different things. It's around public education, policy changes, of course, healthcare interventions, uh, social media, a whole range of different things that are needed if we are to improve and address the challenge of rising obesity. So it's these kind of ideas that have come now into palliative and end of life care. And the question is, do systems exist in death, dying and grieving? Well, to answer this, we need to look at the Lancet Commission that I mentioned we published this time last year. This is a QR code for um, if you want to download it. It's also it's free to download if you type in the title as well. So we published it last March and it takes a very clear global broad perspective. We did not want this to be a story of certain countries, high, low or middle income countries. It looks beyond palliative care and healthcare services. There was a palliative care commission published in 2017. So this goes beyond that. And it wanted to look at health, death, dying, grieving as, as social issues. And so therefore needing to understand structural issues like gender, race and power considered alongside relationships, communities, healthcare services, philosophy, religion, consumerism, and economics. And so we had a really broad lens that we looked at death, dying, and grieving through. 
But crucially, we couldn't make sense and, and begin to advocate for change unless we use a systems lens to really understand this, because everything is so interconnected with this, this more so than many other um, healthcare challenges. And so we wanted to understand it through a systems lens, understanding and embracing that complexity. And it was hopeful and intentional. We wanted to ensure that this wasn't just tra tracing all of the challenges of what's wrong with how people are dying, caring and grieving at the moment, but to look to the future and to be hopeful with how things could change and crucially to understand what's already being done to improve those experiences. The key messages for the report well, first of all, we were challenged to, when we started the report, people asked us, is death and dying over medicalized? And when we, after we examined this over a number of years and really explored it, we found that it wasn't as simple as that. In some places, death is over medicalized and people are treated um, with treatments they don't wish to have and treatments that um, are inappropriate. But for many more, there's no treatment either for curative or basic care for um, illnesses, or obtaining any palliative care or support as they're dying. So dying in the 21st century is a paradox. People are both over-treated and under-treated. And that happens in the same city uh, to, to different people that happens across different countries. Death, dying and grieving, we say today has become unbalanced with the balance taking, being taken um, over by healthcare settings, hospitals, institutions and professionals, when actually the community need a much stronger role. And this, we will come on to more of the role of compassionate communities. Some clear links with the climate crisis, the delusion that we're in control of and not part of nature, and both with the idea that we'll somehow beat death and cure every disease, that we're not part of nature, we're somehow above it. Rebalancing death and dying depends on changes across death systems. And the disadvantaged and powerless suffer most from this current imbalance in systems that we see. The five principles of a realistic utopia are described, and this is where we describe a new vision of how death and dying could be. The challenge of transforming how people die and grieve today has been recognised and responded to many by around the world, and we'll come on to that, but more concerted and joined up action is needed, as radical change across all death systems is a collective responsibility. Now, this is a map, again, not meant to be examined in detail, but meant to show a picture of what that complexity in the end of life care system or death, dying and grieving, what it looks like and why the idea that if we simply get opioid availability right or if we um, simply get people having more conversations about death and dying, the system will be will change. We need to have multiple interventions, understanding the complexity of what influences how, where, why people die. So in the commission, we defined um, death systems and we talk about rebalancing, how we would begin to rebalancing, re rebalance them. So rebalancing death and dying will depend on changes across death systems. And death systems are the many interrelated social, cultural, economic, religious and political factors that determine how death, dying and bereavement are understood and managed. And so that really defines what death, dying and grieving systems are and the importance of the multiple different impacts and inputs um, needed to change them. So moving now to the second part of the talk, understanding how we can begin to shift and transform these systems to make them work better for people and society. The key thing here to understand when thinking about changing death, dying, grieving systems is that they are dynamic. They are always changing. And that old phrase that you can never step into the same river twice is the same with systems. They are different today than they were yesterday because life has happened, attitudes have changed, events have happened. And all of these different events um, and shifts are meaning that they're constantly evolving and changing. And that may be for the better or for the worse, depending on your position within that system. But the key thing is, there are places to intervene. There are places to go in into a system and begin changing it. And there's a great author, a great activist, Donella, Med Don Donella Meadows, who um, has written a lot about systems change. And I recommend reading up on her if you have some time. She's written a great deal. But this is an image taken from uh, one of her um, things that she was talking mainly about climate and sustainability. So she wasn't talking about healthcare. 
but her work has implications and is relevant for all of us working across societal change. And here she says that there are different points that you can intervene in a system, but some of them have much bigger impacts than others. And the further away you are from the, from the center of this, so the further out you are on the far right, the more impact your work and your change is gonna have on the system. And you can see it starts, it's about shifting that balance. So right out of the far right, uh, number one is, it's how you can change the paradigm or the, the, the view, the world view that people have. So at the moment, healthcare is view, um, death and dying is viewed as a, as a healthcare challenge, certainly in the UK and increasingly in many other, um, and certainly in high income countries and increasingly in low and middle income countries. Health, death and dying are not seen as social or cultural events where the community has responsibility. They're seen as problems to be solved in the intensive care unit or in the hospital. And that is a huge paradigm shift that has happened really over recent generations, over recent decades. And so if we could begin to shift that, then that would be a huge change to, to be seen. Yes, of course, there's healthcare components and parts of death, dying, uh, death and dying and caring, but there are many more parts that sits within a much broader societal place and the community has a responsibility and a role within that. If we could shift that, that would, call, that would change, lead to a huge change. If you go all the way down, you can see that further near, further to the centre, then there's a few changes that you could change things like the rules of the system or who has access to information um, and those kind of things. So you can begin tinkering, really making smaller changes that still have a, have a change, but take much more time to work. So this is a helpful thing when we begin thinking about systems change and intervening in systems. This is one of my favourite tables from the Lancet Commission. It's figure five and it's a table quite near the end. And here we took um, Donella Meadows list of the different levels that you can intervene in a system, uh, ways of changing and transforming systems. And we list them along the far left. Um, and then we describe what that would look like if we were to do that for death, dying and breathing. So we talk about changes then within the death system. What would that look like? And then crucially, because we know there are people, activists, practitioners around the world who are already doing this and achieving amazing change, we then um, picked up those examples and captured them in the final column, the examples of change. And I think this is one of the most uplifting and exciting um, parts of the whole report. And in here is where compassionate communities sit. So they, this is where we begin seeing compassionate communities as a really crucial way of achieving systems change. So I'm going to talk now the final part about what compassionate communities mean, what their significance is, and how they can lead to systems change to significantly change and improve outcomes experiences for people as they're dying. So one of the confusing things about um, uh, compassionate communities, new public health approaches is there are so many different terms and phrases. And here I've listed some of them community engagement, community participation, social approaches, public health approaches, patient and public involvement, community action, community development, empowerment, uh, health promoting palliative care, compassionate cities, you may have heard. And this is part because this, these areas, this thinking draws on many, many different, it has deep roots across multiple different areas within healthcare, within public health, within community development, within radical, more radical philosophies of empowerment and political philosophies. So it has a very wide base and it draws on a very wide range of influences. Um, and the key thing is to remember that you need to be clear with what approach you're um, being informed by. But actually, the, the, the title you use doesn't matter. As long as you're clear and describe what you're doing, um, then actually the, cho the choice of term doesn't matter so much. But compassionate communities is now a kind of umbrella term for work taking place in the community to improve death, dying and care. And the key principles of compassionate communities, the first thing is that there's a belief that death, dying and grieving are universal social and spiritual processes. Now, they have... Uh, medical challenges, of course, and looking at opioid availability and um, access to healthcare uh, and symptom control is really crucial. But that's not the entirety of it. There's so much more. That's the smaller part. And um, in Kerala, 
when I was first uh, working there a long time ago, back in 2003, there was a phrase that really stuck in my mind and really helped me as a young doctor understand what my role was within uh, end of life care. And Suresh Kumar, who is director of the Institute in Kerala in India, said that chronic and life limiting illnesses are social problems with medical components. But the problem is we view them as medical problems with social components. So it's flipping that model on its head. And that really resonated with me and really helped me reframe my whole understanding of what the role of healthcare and medical care was within end of life care. Compassionate communities focus explicitly on social justice and on equity. They believe that the current inequity is unacceptable and they work to find solutions to allow all within a society, all within a community to have better experiences when dying, caring and grieving. They are by definition participatory, so they focus on everyone being involved depending on their role and their ability. And that is within professionals and communities. So it's not only within communities and it's not obviously only within professional services. So the key thing is, is that everyone brings in their expertise, their confidence, their capacity, whatever they're able to bring, they bring that. And good compassionate communities knit all of that together like a tapestry. And then everyone has a role to play. So they're fundamentally about participation. They understand community power. And here we see this is not um, community coming in to fill the gaps that healthcare is unable to do. Um, and uh, communities are going to fill things that aren't funded through charities, etc. Actually, what we're recognizing here is the community has a power to manage its own health needs, to give um, and develop its own strength. And that's what needs to take place. And that's what compassionate communities are really un unearthing or unmasking and giving space for that to grow. Relationships are really crucial within this work, and that is a key part. As I mentioned, often systems fail because they have no relationship across the different parts. And so building relationships is really crucial, as is the capacity within communities to respond to health challenges. And often you see with compassionate communities, they may start um, with dealing with issues of death, dying and loss and challenging those, but they may then move on to other areas around maternal health or mental health or poverty, other inequities. And so often they're about social action. It's really giving communities a voice and agency to start this work. It's important links with universal health care and primary health care and palliative care is now known to be um, accepted as a part of universal um, health care. And crucially, it's about understanding the social determinants of dying and grieving well and understanding that healthcare services are not going to change these. We really understand the role of social determinants in our health and that health is determined by the relationships that we have, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the ed access to education um, and money that we have. Same with experiences at the end of life. These social determinants are really important to understand. So the Compassionate Communities Movement has been going for about 25 years now. And so there are many interpretations, very different interpretations all around the world. And Public Health Palliative Care International is um, an umbrella organization, international organization, which tries to bring together all these different approaches, these different actors, these different activists, um, research, policy, advocacy, and practice examples to try and pull together to learn, because it can be quite lonely and quite difficult trying to start something uh, yourself in an area. And so this aims to try and link people globally. This is a map of just a few of the places um, that um, we see this happening in at the moment. So we've got um, Canada, UK, the NNPC um, in Kerala and Compassionate Communities in Thailand that I've added on. So it's a really big um, example. So the, probably the first and the most um, well-known Compassionate Community developed in Kerala in the southern state of um, uh, India in started in kind of 1993 but really developed properly in 2001 and this neighborhood network uh, in palliative care tried to tackle the challenge that people who needed palliative care were not getting it so under one percent of people who needed palliative care were getting it and they transformed that to over 70 percent by um, this new model that they developed 
It's now a WHO collaborating centre recognised as providing um, an amazing model that is now being replicated all over the world. And they provide the actual clinical care, the medical care is done by nurses and doctors, but this is a small component of it. And the main part is done by a huge movement of 10 to 15,000 trained volunteers who go out to see people at home to understand the social, spiritual, economic, other challenges that they're having, work with that local community to meet those needs, and within when then within that support them to take the right medication to manage pressure sores to manage um, side effects and things like that but they have this big groundswell of support underneath um, families who are experiencing uh, serious illness and then into bereavement um, supporting children to remain in school bereaved spouses to find new ways of earning money etc so it really is a whole holistic and a really truly holistic model so a lot of people have um, been inspired by this model. And the key thing is that it's, it's not owned by a hospice or by a palliative care service. Each area has its own um, palliative care team, uh, a, a, a model which is run by volunteers. They employ doctors. So it's owned by the local community and they then employ the healthcare or other people who need to come in. And the key thing is, is it's not only looking up often you can ask for, um, volunteers to input into something that's run by a, by a serious by a hospice, but actually is only um, is really led by professionals and they just fill in the gaps. Whereas this is really about seeing participation of the community as an end in itself, where the community sets up a process to control its own development. So the aim really isn't just around providing the service, it's also to improve the community's ability to take action about anything that is facing it and anything that matters. And we've seen examples in Kerala of this happening. And I've got only over 10,000 trained volunteers now delivering palliative care, and it's really transformed experiences in the whole state. So I wanted to know, having spent a long time working with this project in Kerala, what it would look like if I took the principles and tried to interpret it in a urban London context. So we started the project Compassionate Neighbours, which is the UK interpretation of the neighbourhood network in Kerala. So we followed a lot of the ideas and the, the model that they developed, which is starting with a question for the community, could you be a compassionate neighbour? So rather than going out and saying, we have a new service, come and join up, it was going out and saying, what, what's it like to live and die around here? Are you, what's your role in that? And could you be someone who takes a more active role? Could you be a compassionate neighbour? And we purposely used the term neighbour because this was not around being a, a mini professional, not about doing a role. This is actually about them being what they know they are and we can all be good or bad neighbors but this is a non-professional role and something that everyone knows what it's like to be a good neighbor so we started at the top what's it like to live die and grieve in this community people then after these discussions uh, came forward if they wanted to be part of a movement we then trained people in groups um, and this is not about learning new roles or flow charts this is around them understanding their own losses how to support people who are facing serious illness and creating networks and relationships on streets in apartment blocks in villages to understand kind of what that meant when people came together to respond to the local problems there risk boundary safety this is discussed things that people were really worried about in the uk um, what happens if people don't want me to go into their house what happens if something bad happens if they fall over or if some money is stolen how could, how will we make sure we do the right thing and so we went through how to support and manage that people then matched with someone locally on their street living nearby and they would develop a role as peers as as kind of colleagues as friends not as professionals this is not around delivering a service to people but this is around connecting people locally and this then supports further community dialogue and then answer questions continue to say, what is it like now to live, die and grieve in this community? And could we start um, continuing that dialogue? So the circle goes round and the idea is that that area, that community gradually becomes a more compassionate place to live and die. Um, and this is just a map of where in the southeast of England, we've been developing that. There's now over 2000 volunteers, not as many as in Kerala, but a really good start to really begin shifting the experiences of people at the end of life. 
So my PhD back in 2014 was evaluating this and I wanted to understand what effect did it have on um, people's experiences when you set up a compassionate community. And the key results was the first that training builds networks and relationships rather than building a new role. So it, it was not about teaching people, often there's volunteers in different organisations where you have the list of what you can do, what you can't do, here's your role. And they're part of the workforce. They're often about saving money and supporting the organisation or that mission. This was about, not about asking people to be like that. This is about bringing them in and saying, what could you do? What do you see as a solution? What's your role here? Relationships are fundamental. It's hard to overstate the role of compassionate community, of relationships in compassionate communities. And they're both a process, so that's they're both kind of how things change and how things are improved, but also they're the outcome. That's what you're aiming for, new relationships and new networks existing across that community that weren't there before. It's really important to understand and acknowledge power differentials that exist across communities, they exist within healthcare structures, they exist between healthcare structures and communities, and you have to acknowledge those and understand how that can be improved and changed, because people need to, act, need to um, work across um, as being peers, and I really saw that in my research when I was undertaking this, that it only really worked when people, the power differentials were tackled and people could, could work together as equals with respect. And once you had those equal equitable relationships, then you could start um, having a mutual response. So reciprocity, so both people being able to um, input in a relationship, to advise, to give and to receive. So this is around kind of a reciprocal relationship, a normal one that goes forwards and backwards. But in healthcare, we don't have reciprocal relationships. We have one way relationships of dependence where the patient is dependent upon the doctor or nurse. But this is totally different in compassionate communities. We want reciprocal relationships where everyone, even if they are at the end of life, can contribute and input and give something to other people. So my PhD found that there's three fundamental components that, un that underpin compassionate neighbours. And the first was to address differences in power and to address the power imbalances. And without that, it's very hard to move forward because you need to have reciprocal relationships to then allow people to interact as people, to feel that they're growing from their, these relationships that are not just passive in them. And once you begin to have a series of reciprocal relationships in a community where everyone understands their role and feels that they have something to give, then you start seeing the development of agency where people can change their experiences. They've got the ability to understand what's happening and change what they're, how they're experiencing something or those around them. And so agency is a really key thing for communities to have to improve experiences around death, dying and loss, but also beyond that. So the key messages from my study from Compassionate Neighbours is that these are not new services and healthcare is really good at sucking things up and taking them over, but these are not new services. They're new ways of responding to the natural parts of all our lives. They re represent an upstream intervention for end of life care. So they are looking at times when people are much well. So these networks, when people are well and thinking about how could I improve my society? These are ways of thinking about death, dying, loss and grieving before it happens. Whereas palliative care services are a downstream intervention because they wait until someone actually is diagnosed with a life limiting illness. And then we begin thinking about what's important to you. What networks do you have? Where would you like to be? So that's a very much a downstream kind of acute response. And compassionate community stream are an upstream um, early response. It develop, explores and develops the relationships between, compassion, between professionals and communities, and that's a really important thing to understand. And as I mentioned before, power, agency and relationships are central. So my final thoughts. Compassionate communities are a key component of systems change, and they're one of the key ways that we're seeing those leverage points that I mentioned in that big seesaw beginning to really shift and change the way people understand death and dying, the way they respond to it, the way healthcare responses are. And we certainly, I can certainly see in the UK, which um, where I can see my practice, there's been a real shift in the mindset of what it takes to live and die well. It's not just a healthcare response. It's not just about whether you have a palliative care team coming to see you and availability of morphine. 
the understanding of the role of the social is now much more significant. And that's because of the compassionate communities movement in the UK. But the question is, how do we leverage change that we see within compassionate communities that can be quite isolated and dependent on each small community? How can we leverage it to start leading and um, to whole systems change? And this is where you start thinking about national dialogue, narratives, policy, how you begin sharing the stories of the impact of your work more broadly so that this becomes a joined up response. And also crucially, what other voices exist in dying and grieving? We within uh, compassionate communities are not the only voices. How can we bring in other people, other actors, build other relationships across areas where people wouldn't think to be involved in that? Because that's where we begin to really understand that whole system and really begin to shift significant change by bringing in people who would not otherwise think to be involved. Um, and then we can then begin actually understanding the whole breadth of the system and the change that we need to make. Thank you.